so this I'm going to present a couple of preliminary results in some work along with, uh, in collaboration with Goethe University, specifically Christian Kexel and his advisor, Joachim Moll, over there. And this talk is going to primarily focus on talking a little bit about guided waves and phase dispersion compensation. Now, as our last talk just sort of illustrated, guided waves are a very nice tool. And I think I've been working on it over the past, I guess, 10 to 20 years almost, which will allow us to monitor or test large areas of structures at once. So the general idea is we can have some ultrasonic waves that travel throughout the structure, that travel through the thickness of the structure from a collection of sensors to determine if there is damage in a structure, where the damage may be, and hopefully down the line what kind of damage there is in the structure. Ten years, uh, both in understanding the propagation and in signal processing methods to use. There are complications that we always have to try to deal with, particularly in the signal processing domain. And one of those big complications. And so here we see on the bottom the dispersion curves for the LAM wave, the wave in aluminum plate in this case, where we have frequency on the x axis. We have wave number on the y axis. And as many of you probably know, if we have, say, a, a signal, a wave traveling at about 400 kilohertz, we would excite two modes, the S0 mode and the A0 mode, one traveling with a 500 uh, inverse meters wave number, one traveling with a 1,000 inverse meters signal, and we get out two wave modes, both traveling at different velocities, since wave number is related to velocity. So we're going to talk a little bit about the dispersion part. So that was the multimodal part. This is the dispersion. And I want to talk about two types of dispersion, because we're going to look at one of these. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the group velocity dispersion. About when we talk about dispersion. And group velocity dispersion essentially happens when we send out a pulse. We're sending out a collection of frequencies, not just one frequency tone. So some of those frequencies are going to travel at a slightly different frequency, and we're going to get some distortion of the envelope of our The other type of dispersion that we often see, but a lot of people kind of see, dispersion. And by that, I simply mean phase velocity dispersion is when the phase velocity does not match up with the group velocity. And we can see that here, because we see are traveling across at a different rate than the actual envelope of the wave itself. And in many cases, we really see phase velocity dispersion. But if we want to do any kind of coherent processing, we want a very high resolution result, detection result, we want to know what the phase of our signal is. If we don't, then we have to make some approximations. For example, we take the envelope of the signal, and we don't get quite as good information. So the focus of this talk is going to be on removing some of this phase. And we're going to assume that we know the group velocity. And this is a pretty good assumption, because there are lots of methods to determine group velocity. Simple time of flight, envelope, time frequency analysis methods. There's a lot of different techniques that we can use. Phase velocity is a little bit more difficult. There are a couple methods. Uh, there's a sparse number analysis method, which I developed in previous work and presented here in previous years. Uh, Fourier transfer methods that have been around for a long time. But all of these require a lot of sensors to measure the phase velocity well. In complicated cases, a lot of sensors may be necessary. So we want to be able to compensate for the phase velocity with only one sensor, not a lot of sensors. So essentially, we have down here this is experimental data, uh, where we have our measured signal in blue and a group velocity estimate, which assumes the group velocity and phase velocity are the same, uh, in red. And we can see that they do not match up. So we want to develop something that will make these. And we're going to do that using a filter approach, specifically an adaptive 
And there's two reasons that we're using an adaptive FIR filter approach. One is that, well, it's going to work, or at least we're going to see that it works pretty well so far uh, in these preliminary results. But it's very, very efficient. Adaptive FIR filters have been around for a long time. Uh, and they're very efficient algorithms, uh, very efficient hardware implementations to set this up. So we can easily design a hardware implementation. So this is our basic adaptive filter setup that we're considering. So we have this setup where we have R of T here, which is essentially a transmitting the signal. R of T is just our excitation that has been shifted by some amount according to the group velocity we assume we know. Uh, we also have N of T, which is some noise, which we're assuming that this white gap. So the reference signal goes to some dispersion. It gets added to the noise, and what we actually measure is some S of T. So this is our measured signal. And the goal of this adaptive filter is to minimize the air between this reference, R of T, and our measurement S of T. So essentially, it is remove the dispersion while at the same time minimizing the error the noise that we get out of it. So a couple of things that we have to mention here uh, that we are using. One is that we are assuming that the dispersion is not true in general, but for narrow band signals, that it is approximately true. Uh, and also, it should be noted that any any wideband signal is going to decompose into a large collection of narrowband signals. And you could do that in a slide of narrowband signal one at a time. Uh, we also think that the dispersion, or really the adaptive filter dispersion, can be done with the FIR filter, which we see will work pretty well. And also, too much, so pretty much adaptive filters run off of this uh, Where here on the left hand side of this equation, we have what is known as the uh, autocorrelation matrix, which is essentially the autocorrelation. And each row is just the k value, the k of t, if it is a by and on the other side of the equation, we have a sometimes known as cross correlation uh, with each row shifted by one, multiplied by a reference. This would become an inverse problem. That's where the algorithm comes in to solve this. Additional step at the end. Where we take our filter coefficients f of t and we involve them in our reference r of t. So let's look at a couple of results from this. I'll say that these are still very few. Uh, they are experimental, but very simple simulations, uh, simple experiments that we're working with uh, so far. So we have a wave that we've taken from an aluminum plate. Uh, technically, these waves are captured using a laser doppler. Uh, and the only way that we can with about 60 measurements that lie along the line of uh, the We're measuring through the laser doppler. Uh, with 10 window tone bursts. And is pretty minimal in, to in total. So this is the kind of data that we have uh, from this experiment. So on the top here, in red, it does not line up very well. And line up very well. So this is just focus to the measured data to make it line up. For something like this would be something like local. We have some kind of reference that we want to compare our measurement to in order to figure out where that 
sources of rising sun. Uh, for a slightly more area, we can synthetically have another pulse right here. What happens here is again at the top where we have no filtering, we do not have any good alignment. And on the bottom here, we have good alignment, but we only have alignment now between the reference and the register signal uh, at the area that we're interested in. So this pulse here, the reflection that we're not interested in, does not get any phase compensation. And for something like um, this is we do not want to cohere information. We want that to be incoherent, and we do not want to find where that is. So another possible application of this is a robust baseline subtraction is the temperature changes a little bit. That ends up changing the phase of our signal quite significantly, and we get a mismatch between some baseline measurement and our current measure. So in this approach, we can, instead of trying to fit one of our signals to a reference, we can fit both of our signals to the reference. So in this case, we take both, one is a current measurement, one is the baseline, throw them into the adaptive filter, and suddenly they both match each other very nicely. So we can use this to make them fit each other, and then apply the, and then do a subtraction, and so we did the subtraction here, you see we get a pretty decent subtraction, not perfect, uh, but a pretty decent subtraction, whereas this one was very poor uh, in total. So these are the preliminary results that we have over this system uh, and potential for this use for localization and imaging applications and some possible baseline subtraction applications. So thank you very much.